Richard, does the uh, cost of the additional land needed for multi-paddock grazing, was that in the figures, the comparative figures of what the costs are to uh, farmers? Yes, and it, it, yes, and um, that, that was the last cycle analysis, so it includes all the all the background noise too. Um, if you look at the, the fencing and stuff that people are putting in, electric fencing, it, it turns out if you amortize it over, t over 10 years or so, um, it, it's, it's pennies in the dollar. And, and the yield, the return on investment is huge. It's, it's hundredfold. Great. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm a farmer, and I'd like to produce a prototype for a net negative carbon footprint farm. Uh, I use dairy cattle. We do a, a hybrid mob grazing. Our organic matters in our soils are between 7 and 9.6 right now. I'd like to know, um, do, for my woodlands, is it better um, from a carbon standpoint to um, maintain my woodlands, or should I um, go to slivo pasture or some grazing in those areas? Which is going to be the better net, net, net carbon sink? I would advise adopting a more holistic view than the one you've just professed. There are other things, there's biodiversity issues, pollinator issues, and stuff like that that also need to be taken into account. You can manage those woodlands so that they're achieving the right amount of carbon in the ground. You might want to open them up and have a pasture with them in some circumstances uh, to, to broaden your goal. But you also need to look at those other aspects to, to look at the whole system you're dealing with and, and the whole um, the other desirable things you can put in there. But it sounds as if you're doing pretty much the right things already. Hello. I, I would presume that some invasive species would, um, would, would be negatively affected um, through, through the multi-paddock system. Um, but I would also guess that there are probably some undesirable plants that uh, might not uh, respond to that treatment. And I'm just wondering if you could share with us any caveats, really, to the holistic approach as, as far as what might, uh, what, what might occur biologically with certain plant species that don't appear to respond to this treatment. There are indeed some species, particularly coming from outside North America, that do pose those kind of problems. Um, and California is, is a fairly tough environment. Um, because it's just got a short growing season. So while they pose limits, if you manage for the right things, you, you can use, develop into your grazing plan um, what is the, the weak point on your problem plant and attack it at that particular point and then uh, combine with that the, the treatments that are going to result in, in movement forward of the plants that you want. And those principles applied in the ground have generally I don't work in that with those particular problems, but I know people who had success by combining that way of thinking uh, to achieve desired goals. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy Taylor, with Breakthrough Strategies and Solutions. Two quick questions. Tom, I'd love you to, to, to say a little bit about why the UN climate process from your perspective, is excluding uh, carbon sequestration through soil in the, in the run-up to Paris next year. And the second is, you know, I live very heavily in the climate world, both philanthropic and NGO, corporate, and this, the, one of the key critiques is always, yeah, this can work, but not for very long. The carbon actually will get released. Can you, any of you speak to that critique, that we don't have the data that demonstrates that the carbon once sequestered, will stay in the soil. So those two fundamental questions. 
Okay. Um, the whole UN climate change negotiations is, is kind of fall into a fictitious world, so to speak. Um, when the original draft was written, I actually was working at the UN, and I put in a lot of language requiring complete accounting of all greenhouse gas sources and sinks worldwide. That was all watered down. Governments threw that out because they didn't want to have to account for things. And then then they, what they did is they went and selectively put in those things that the, their fossil fuel industries thought were relevant. So, for instance, they knew they were going to have to account for fossil fuel emissions because that was, that was obviously part of the whole package. But then the U.S., for example, proposed that they, countries get credit for photosynthesis, but they didn't count respiration. So, you know, uh, and, and so the result is they selectively picked what things they wanted to count for and what they didn't want to count for on, on grounds of political inconvenience. The result is that the whole carbon accounting framework makes no scientific sense because it's just totally incomplete. It just needs to be rationalized to make scientific sense in order to be an effective management tool. It isn't now. And so right now, as a result, people can get carbon credits for planting trees, whether the trees die or get burned or, or, or you know, get eaten by insects or, or burn up in forest fires, they can get credits for planting trees. In some cases, they get the credits and never plant the trees and just disappear with the money. But you can't get credits for putting carbon in the ground. That's just simply not recognized formally as a carbon sink. And governments have to stand up and say, well, wait a minute, we want soils to be included as a carbon sink as well, and they need to demand that money be allocated by all the UN-related funding agencies for all projects that increase carbon by any means, in any form, in any place. That's not on the table right now. And right now, the, the meetings that are happening in Lima, governments have no strategy for dealing with them. They're all running away from the problem and pointing fingers at each other. And so what we need to see is that those countries that are going to be most affected by climate change accept the responsibility to propose solutions that include soils. I work primarily with the small island developing states. We're also trying to work with the, the Sahel states from West Africa, the, the UN Convention on Combating Desertification. And we're trying to get these people to realize that they're the first victims of climate change. They're the ones that have to propose solutions. And we're just trying to get a government with the backbone to stand up and say, oh, wait a minute, we want carbon to be included in the accounting. That's all it really takes. So far, we haven't found a government willing to stand up and do that because when the small island states actually try to propose things that would protect them from being drowned by sea level rise, they get bought off by the rich countries that say, well, just sign on to, to the 350 degree or 450 degree target and we won't take your foreign away, aid money away. So they get bribed to actually sign on to agreements that are a suicide pact. They're a death sentence for them. But, but that's, that's a stage of unreality that we're dealing with with governments. They don't understand the scientific issues at all, and they're not proposing serious solutions. We, we hope to see that change. Um, I, I think that there are a couple of things. I mean, a lot of people say the UN is irrelevant, and that's true in many ways, but it's the only global decision-making group that we have. And we need governments to demand effective action at the same time that people are taking grassroots initiatives on for their own private reasons to increase their own carbon. That's not enough. I mean, as I said in, you know, yesterday, there are millions of people doing the right thing for their own selfish reasons. But we need billions, not millions. That's the point. We need everybody who is on the land doing the right thing in order to solve the problem. Can you answer Betsy's other questions? Anybody other questions? Oh, yeah. I, I, I have a comment. I, I think the reason why Saul gets treated like dirt um, <laughs> is um, historical scientific artifact. Um, the work on soils has been historically in agricultural colleges of various sorts with a very different emphasis. The work of IPCC, in my view, has come largely out of the oceanography community. And if you talk to these people, the ocean does everything. The ocean creates climate change, the ocean sequesters carbon, the ocean will sop up the CO2, the ocean is all important. And this sort of broad brush oceanographic approach was translated by NASA into a remote sensing approach. So we soil scientists are left in the dust, basically. And that's why meetings like this are important. We need to change that perception. Ah, 
Well, actually, yes. Yeah, let me just answer that <laughs> briefly. I mean, the thing is, soil carbon comes in many forms. And I mean, some of them, like the sugars, are going to be decomposed almost instantly by bacteria. Other forms, like elemental carbon, like biochar, essentially have an infinite lifetime. I mean, people argue about how long it lasts because depending on how you treat it, you either can get, if you treat it at low pressure, low temperature for a short period of time, you get stuff that decomposes quickly. If you treat it at high temperature, you get stuff that doesn't decompose at all. And in fact, I mean, I, Greg, I'm sure here can tell you there are forest fire ashes that are 350 million years old that are so perfectly preserved you can recognize every cell in the plant that grew them. I mean, the, the stuff just doesn't decompose once it's put into the soil. Yeah, the, the idea that soil carbon is volatile goes back almost entirely to a seminal paper by Schlesinger in the 1970s, in which he used a completely black box approach using carbon isotopes of the organic matter to assume that it was all labile. It's just wrong, as we know now from the biochar work and other work, that there's a whole variety of organic compounds in soils, many of them quite stable over long periods of time. But this Schlesinger paper is so influential among people who are um, in the IPCC and other institutions concerned with climate change. They think it's all just going to volatilize once the temperature goes up. 